All right, I'm gonna go over roads. Um, and here again, roads aren't like the sexy kind of thing, like we're doing aquaculture, like swimming in wetlands or anything fun like that. But roads are like, you know, we all have to have access. Access is one of the top things that we need on our land. And we have to have good access. Roads can make you or break you. Roads, if we can, if you have the opportunity to position your road on the south side of your land. Does anybody have a road that's on the north side of their property? Yeah, Richard, how's that? That's horrible, it really yeah. is. Absolute maintenance issues. I mean, you wouldn't think much, I mean, what, what difference does it make? What happens is when you get a blade in the snow, you, you tend to get aggressive just to get the hole cleared and it, you get too deep and it digs the gravel out, then you've got to spend all that extra money in the spring fixing what you've damaged in the winter, or you just don't go up and down the road for three days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's, it's it a stays very, very poor icy place. and icy and slippery. Wet. And I, I have a, I just see 15% slope max, so I've got a 20% slope max. So you've got all that compounded. Yeah. And there's nothing I could do about it. I mean, I, I bought the house and the, and the land like that. And, uh, you know, the, the only favor was done to me, which I thought was awful, the power company came in and cut trees, which I couldn't do anything about. Um, but it turned out to be a blessing because it let a little light in. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's it. If we have the chance, let's put our roads on the south side because they will dry out quicker and we'll need less gravel on them, less maintenance, like Richard said. You need southern exposure, you know, a slope that has sun. Yeah, 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 in the sun, basically. I mean, it doesn't have to be totally on the south side, but as a rule, you know, if you have that opportunity, that's what you need to shoot for. Also, we don't want a road that, you know, the 15% max. So if we could do a couple things with the road. We can contour a road or slightly off contour, but we don't want to like head straight up the hill. You know, and here, most of us are going to be dealing with some kind of slope with our road um, because we're in the mountains. And if we go slightly off contour, if this is our topo again, let's just make, make something up here. So there's our topo. The closer these lines are, the steeper this slope is. So maybe your access is, if we went straight up, say this is, let's just say this is our scale and this is 100 feet. Let's just say, let's just pretend. So this amount is 100 feet. If I went straight up this, that's 100 feet, that would be a 40% slope. Does that make sense? Because topos are 10, I mean, you can get more accurate topos that maybe are five foot, or if you survey, you know, have a survey. But if you go to the GIS, the geographical information systems, that's basically your tax map, you can get a lot of information for free off of that. So that's what you're gonna start with. You're gonna start you know, figuring out your topos. So, I mean, this just is common sense and I don't wanna you know, overstate it too much, but if you went straight up that, that's a huge slope. If we can go slightly off contour, so say we entered it here, and we do something like this. And then this is one, two, three, four, five, you know, basically 500 feet over 40 foot height. So our slope angle is much less. And the other cool thing we can do is we can, you know, in theory, like a short road is kind of nice because in theory, you need less gravel, but then you're gonna have a lot more erosion and a lot more maintenance with that slope. If we stretch that road out, we're gonna have more initial investment in the road, but a lot less maintenance over the years. So this is contour, this is slightly off contour. Does that make sense? And then we could start doing stuff like 
like switchbacks. So a switchback, we're just turning, coming back the other way. And then we could kind of run it up this way, and then we're off contour, and then maybe we switch back, and then we're up the top here, if that's our goal. Instead of, you'll see this so often, people just shoot straight up, and then it's just a nightmare road from then on out. So I want you guys to avoid that, guys and girls, people. People avoid that at all cost. Um, the, also, the cool thing is when you stretch it out like this, now what you've done is you have access to all these different parts of your land that you didn't have access to before. And if you went straight up like this, you can only basically access each side of your road. But here, you're accessing all this slope which it might be kind of cool, like you can do different things with it. You know, you could plant it out. It may have neat features. It's steep. It could have rock. And then you're up into this flatter area. See how the contour is farther away? So this is a lot flatter here. So then you're in area where's potential growing area right here. So you can actually grow food in this area, and then you could access the whole thing. And then here's another potential growing area, and then you could access it, and then you're at the top. So I made the same mistake, basically, when I put my road in, when I was like in my 20s. Um, it basically went straight up the hill, and it was horrible. And then we had a lot of erosion coming down it, um, constant maintenance, and then eventually, I redesigned it, and I put it slightly off contour, and then I was able, I'm able to access like four or five acres from the road that was totally not accessible at any other point. And here you've got options, you know, then you, then you could shoot off, even if it's just a, a path or a trail, on contour and you could be totally level. You know, anywhere here you could come this way and you're totally level if you wanted to access this area. You're totally level. And the cool thing is these switchbacks also, this is a great spot for maybe a little pond um, in that area, in this area. That you could collect water off of the road to fill that pond and then slow that down. So here you're going to have, you definitely, that's, that's a lot bigger job, but you're going to be happy when you're just like, you know, you're, you're down to 10% grade or whatever it may be, and you're just kind of cruising up, and you, you know, the new road that I put in, I might scrape it once a year now, where before it was like just a constant thing. Every time it rained, it got washed out, more gravel, more maintenance, more cost, more energy. So there again, we're working with nature, we're harmonizing, we're working with the patterns. Um, and this is just theoretical. Generally, we want to stay away from the very bottoms, you know, developing the bottom land. We want to save that for farmland. That's pretty good for farmland. You know, that floods really easily. And generally, we want to stay away from, we can use ridges, but we don't want to position our house um, necessarily on top of a ridge because then we're exposed to the elements. You know, that winter wind whips through there. So, so that's, okay, and then here's a third. So that's the road going straight up. Here's the road on contour. It's getting a little messy. I hope you guys can still see. Well, let me just redraw this. I'll give you another example here of a road on a ridge, a road going up a ridge. And a ridge, in your head, you may think a ridge is the top portion, but the ridge has a heel and it comes all the way down to the base, usually. So that ridge keeps going. 
okay, this is the flat portion, but this is still, do you see the pattern in the landscape? That this is, this is a ridge all the way up. So here's another great thing we can do. If the land sits like this and it works out, we can run our road up the ridge. And that would be something like this. And what that accomplishes is water sheds, sheds this way off the road all the way up. And water goes perpendicular to our topo lines. So water is always, no matter where I go, like this is the way the water is going to run. You know, does that make sense? The water is shedding away perpendicular to those topos. So in a ridge, if you put your road on this ridge, the whole way up, water is shedding to the side instead of running down the road. That makes sense? And that, this is great. It's like a super low maintenance road. Um, and these are basic things, but you know, we need to go over them. Um, crown. Everybody know what crown is on a road, right? It's basically like that. If this were flat, you know, it'd be like that. A crown is like this. This may be exaggerated a little bit, but we can do 2% slope on either side to shed the water. This is a section view of a road, like you're looking into the road. Does that make sense? So the water sheds. We're getting the water off the road as quick as we possibly can. Because what we don't want is the water to build up on the road and start eroding it. And water has a tendency to start building up, gains speed, it gains velocity, it starts taking more material with it all the way down. So we can slope it like this, or say we have a bank, or maybe that's a little steep, and we do a cut and a fill, so our original slope comes down like this, and this may be a little exaggerated, but something like this. So if we do a cut and a fill right here, this is, this is cut. We need to angle that back. And then this is all fill, and that needs to be compacted in small layers, right? But now what I've done is we're 2% grade this way into the bank coming up the hill on contour. So what we don't want here, like if we did a crown here, water would start rolling off this way. And you do not want water to roll off of your fill area because it will erode it. Here, water will gather here. And then, you know, later on down the road, you can take a culvert and pipe the water off the road. And more culverts, the better, like every 50 foot maybe, or 100 foot, you can do a culvert. Guardrails. Guardrails. They're great water bars. Yeah, yeah, they do work well. So the guardrail has this side profile of a guardrail. Here's the post and the guardrail does something weird like it basically creates this little horseshoe shape, and here's your road. So if you, you can get guardrails, this metal section really long at the scrapyard, and then if we're looking down now, plan view, we're looking down on our road, our road doing whatever, like this. Here, we can, and we have a ditch, along the side, and the water builds up all along that. We've got to get that off. 
So, you know, you can, you can have a culvert here to where you're getting the water off the road and it's coming down this way. Or, like they're saying, a guardrail could go in here. And it's basically, it's just, when you turn it, a guardrail on its side, it basically has a little hump on each side. And then this is where the water channel and you bury that in the road that comes across the road like that. The water is in this section. And your tire, your car tire is big enough, but you just drive over that. And it's not enough dip, you know, to really make it rough and it works really well. And you could get a, a lot of people what they do is they'll get a, I think it's like a four inch gap in there maybe, maybe it's a little bit wider, but you can, you can get a special shovel and you cut a shovel that you have just the shovel to clean out your, your guardrail. So no, that's a great idea, yep. And there's a bunch of guardrails at the local scrapyard right now. So you're gonna try to keep your slope, you know, 15% max. You could go up to 20 like Richard said, if you go up to 20, a lot of the times, you know, it's better if you can hard pave that. But, you know, that's really expensive. If not, you need to have a tractor or you need to do a lot of maintenance on it. A Zuni bowl is basically a way of spreading the water out. So when you have your water going to either your guardrail or your culvert and the water is shooting out, Instead of that just shooting out free down into the landscape, say this is our culvert right here, buried under the road. A Zuni bowl is basically just a pile of rocks. This, we're looking down on this from above. It's a pile of rocks like this. The water enters here and it basically creates a basin. And these, the tops of these rocks could be the whole tops or it could be just this area are level. And the water spreads out and flows over this way. So it just is another method to slow and spread the water out. Does that make sense? Yeah, it works really well. You could go from this Zuni bowl and then you could catch the water down lower into a swale, you know, but there's lots and lots of water that come off our roads. And it's a major problem. So here's a couple strategies we can use to deal with that. Um, like I was talking about earlier, run your utilities down the middle of the road if possible. Yes. Put a couple of roads in there, I've always put them on the sides. You can do that, yeah. Right in the middle. Um, because you don't need any extra space. It's easy to cut in there. It's buried deep, different method. If you put it down the side, then it's harder to, you know, the middle of the road, you're never gonna do anything with except basically maintain it. Your focus is to keep that the same. If you run it down the side in a permaculture mindset, your sides are where your edge is. Your edge, is where the extra value is. It's like the spot that we don't normally use, but there's so much lineal or linear footage on the edge. On each side of the road, three foot on each side going up a typical driveway, if it's 100 feet and we have three feet on each side, then we have three times 100 times two on each side that normally we don't use, but we could, you know, that could all be planted out. Um, it makes it harder if you put it down the edge to do like permanent plantings. You still can, but you're just gonna have to be a lot more careful digging and doing all that. So using your edge, stacking your edge, a lot of times your road is gonna dictate a boundary for animals, so you may have a fence line, 
If you have a little space in between that fence line and your road, that could kind of be a garden bed. And you could use that fence as a trellis, you know, for vining plants or fruit trees or different things like that. This factory refers to multiple levels? Multiple levels, yeah, yeah. So you've got your road, you've got a little ditch, you've got a bed here, then you may have a fence here, and then you can grow, grow a vine or you can grow a fruit tree here. And stacking it a lot of times visually and functionally, like you're doing these different zones that plants can grow at. So if the sun's coming this way, you're not blocking the light to, to this because it's higher. So you're stacking them in here and then visually you have this beautiful kind of border. Does that make sense? That's like super functional. You get so much space, like you don't even need to go disturb the center of your best piece of property. Usually, if you start to use all your edge space. And eventually, yeah, you may wanna, you know, use it, but save it for down the road. I talked about this, this is so important. When you start your homestead, like having a way of generating fertility on the homestead. And if you're a vegan farmer, that's great because you can start with worms or soldier flies, you know, and it's, it could be so simple. It doesn't have to be a complicated system at all. It could basically be, I mean, it could be so simple that it's just a pile of rubbish with worms in it. How's that for simplicity? And it's doing its thing. You, you could have sides on it if you wanted to kick it up. You, it could have a roof, it could have solar, whatever. If you have a big enough pile, your red wigglers in the winter, they're gonna go down here in this zone and they'll survive the cold. So, They'll reproduce and they'll break down food scraps and turn it into a high value fertilizer. It's really important to establish that fertility box, like super condensed little spot that you're making fertility on the farm. Because you're not, hey, you don't, you want to work with what you have. You're working with your resources and you don't want to have to buy fertilizer. And this is better stuff than you can even buy. So, Beyond the worm box, you know, next level up is possibly having a chicken yard. And our chickens, we want to keep our chickens, fence them out of our gardens, you know. We don't necessarily want them in that zone right around our house, maybe just a little bit outside of that. Chickens love, because chickens will create a lot of damage in your garden. I don't know if you guys have ever, people have ever lived with chickens. Having an area close to the house, but not right beside the house, because they can be loud and obnoxious. And, um, but chickens do really well with being close and then like opening up to larger systems that they can forage. So, you know, we don't, we don't want to practice animal confinement, but with chickens, you need to confine them some because they will A, cause a lot of damage, and they need to be protected in the night. So you do need to have some confinement for chickens. So if you do a deep, this works awesome, you can do a deep litter yard for chickens. Like if your fence is here, and it's here, and you have your chicken house, say, something like this, and here's the sun angle, and maybe this is bigger, your yard, a deep litter yard is just, and I love to use whatever we can get for free. So wood chips are huge because people are always trying to get wood, rid of wood chips and it's a major carbon sink, it's a major resource. So if we can do build a deep litter yard in here, could be wood chips, it could be um, wasted hay, it could be old straw, it could be leaves. Cone hops. What? Cone hops. 
Oh yeah, cone hops. Well, of course, they're, they're all switching to pelletized, so it's not as available as it used to be. Mm -hmm. So that's a great waste product. Yeah. So then we're using a, a waste resource, and then we're turning it into, we're value adding it, turning it into fertilizer, food and fertilizer, and bedding and all that good stuff. Yeah, if this is built on a little bit of a slope, slight bit of a slope here, what do chickens like to do all day? Crash. Yeah. So if this is running downhill at like a 2% angle again, um, chickens all day long, they just want to scratch. So they're, I don't know if any of you have experienced a deep bedding situation, but what they do is they scratch continuously downhill. And right here, all this is gonna pile up. If you have a little gate here, you can open this gate up. Once they scratch this all the way down, this is transformed. This is like fluffy mulch, fertilizer mulch that you can use. So that you're getting the chickens to do the work for you. The deep litter, there's so many insects in here and they're just having a blast. So you're, you know, you're working with their chickenness, like they're scratching and that's what they want to do. You're just like, like working with the rhythms. You're, you're like doing it, simple. And here, if we have like 30% of this roof with clear panels, the sunlight can come in here and hit this, and you can still have biology going on in here. And we could kick this up, you know, we can, we can do a lot of things with this. We can inoculate all this with indigenous microorganisms, and it's super, super healthy for the chickens. Um, and we could just, you know, we could just geek out with this. But eventually all this deep bedding turns to fertilizer and we could use it. So we're creating on the farm, we've got a system that creates fertilizer, fertility. Um, and then, yeah, the chickens can be, you know, turned out to a larger system. And if we position this higher, a little bit higher than the house, looking down here, we have our house and then we have because we didn't want to use the best piece of land, and we nooked it in here a little bit. We have our contours here, say. If this is higher, our chickens could be up here a little bit, and then they could open up to this bigger system, right, that's fenced in, that could be like forage yards and food forests with fencing around your trees. And, and different things, but then we're preloading the work with our wheelbarrow. We're just going downhill to our gardens and, and putting mulching and fertilizing and building soils. So we're using slope to our advantage if we can get to it with a, you know, easy access. It's positioned above and it's just easy then it's just wheelbarrow down to your garden, and it's just like you're working with gravity again. Super simple. Trying to always keep something growing on our soils is the key, because we get erosion when our soils are bare. And most of us, like it's this new thing to try to, but we've been doing it forever, but to grow in a space that has cover crops and it is not that hard. A lot of times, the right season, you can just knock the cover crop over, you can crimp it, you can use a board with a rope and you could go through there and crimp it or you could get more technical and you could have a crimper on the back of a piece of equipment if it's a bigger area. And then that cover crop lays down if you hit it the right season and then it's your mulch and you can just move it to the side a little bit and plant right in it. And then you have a mulch bed right there that all you had to do is put the seed out and it grows. And then you have all these extra 
things that happen when you have plants growing, you know. You can also just tarp it for a couple of months. You can do that. Yeah. That works. Yeah. The problem with just tarping it, though, is then you're back to bare soil. It was like bare soil when I opened it up. Okay. And it's almost like mulch. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's decomposing. Yeah, it's decomposing. It wasn't going to grow again, put it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just planted on top of it. Yeah, and you can cover crop. You can do a mixed cover crop in that. You could still plant, and then you could do lower. You could do white clover or a buckwheat or different things like that. But, yeah, that's a great, great method. No, it works. That works great. Compost piles, you know, building your compost piles is another way of having a, this fertility machine. It's so important. It's... Our goal is to never to have to run out and to go buy compost, to buy mulch, to buy fertilizer, to buy any of it. Like we want to be self-sufficient. So we have to design the system to do that. So we're gonna like living fertility machines, we just we're just gonna think about that and just keep going with it. Hugel culture works pretty good. Hugel culture is basically uh, wood, you know, you dig out an area and you put wood in it and you pile some soil back on it and you have all this decomposing wood that's breaking down and you could plant on it. Uh, there's some problems with hugel culture. Basically you'll have different rates of decomposition and you'll have some holes that develop over a couple years. So you'll have these spots in there that rodents could get into and that you go out to walk on, it's just like spongy and soft. But the cool thing is about hugel culture is I like to see hugel culture not necessarily planting in it right away and using it for planting, but if you're clearing a piece of land, even if it's just brush, you're piling it into this area, you're putting soil on top of it, you throw your cover crop seed on it, especially if you it's like a lot of brush and a lot of roots and stuff like that, over 10 year period, it's like your carbon bank. It's your bank account. You get a 10 year rate. So it'll break down over 10 years. At the end of that 10 years, you have this whole bank of carbon sitting there that you can use in your garden. Slope, we already talked about slope a bit, but our strategies, our techniques for working with slope, you know, is always going to be contour. Is always going to try to work with the contour. Even if it's super steep, we can build terraces. We're angling that back. This may be a little exaggerated, but just like our road, we're angling it back this way so the water, the water is not running this way anymore. The water is now running back this way, and it collects here. And we could have 2% slope on the terrace and drain the terrace. Or we can hold a certain amount of water, and it kind of be like a little swale right here. Super handy to have. The biggest hurdle to farmers farming is getting a piece of land, is being able to afford a piece of land. So often, we're going to have to settle for a piece of land that is less than ideal in the ideal sense of what we're looking for. Often, in this area, we're going to have a slope to deal with. But we can dig terraces and use that to our advantage. Terraces are great because then you open up. You're actually creating more land, you know, more surface area, where before this measurement was just say 60 feet or whatever, but now we've gone this way, this way, this way, this way, this way, this way, and this way. Now we've just created more surface area to work with. So we can, we can plant on that terrace. You know, I like my terraces to have like this, basically like a bed here. And this is a little steep, but often you can plant, you can plant shrubs here or something that likes that bank. And then you can still have this area for annual vegetable growth. Or this whole thing could be 
you know, plant it out with trees. It works really well, though, to, to use, to stabilize that slope. You may need, it's called net, net and pan. Net and pan is, is basically looking down. If we have a, a super steep slope, we'll, we could create these pans, and it's, it's just like a ring around our trees. So something like this, these are the pans. And we've planted a tree right here in every one. So here's our slope, and our water is coming down here this way. So our net is, is just a little trough that connects them all. So the water fills up the pans and then goes down, fills it up. And it's just another way. This is a great method to stabilize super steep slopes. Any questions about that? So what's the scale of that? I mean, how big is one of those surface this could be This could be two, two or three foot wide, or it could be smaller. I mean, it could be like this, but the wider, then you have more area to catch water. So like a, a moat around each tree? Yeah, yeah, yep. Would they get, would their roots get too soggy then? Potentially, but you're on a slope, so that whole thing is gonna drain pretty quickly. So it, you're gonna have to determine, you know, your base soils, if they hold water for a long time. Yeah, yeah. But usually they're pretty happy. They're pretty happy in this position because they're on a slope they're gaining fertility, they've got water. So storing our water high and taking advantage of gravity. Chickens scratching downhill, we talked about that slope. You also wanna think about cold air falls. You know, if you're gonna think about a vineyard or an orchard or a blueberry patch or anything like that, you know, you wanna figure out where your frost pockets are. And on a slope, generally, you don't have a whole lot of frost pockets because frost pockets, you know, will freeze your flowers and your buds and you won't get food. So you can start to look at, you know, cold air falls down at night, in the winter, you know, warm air rises in the day and in the summer. So slope, you're taking advantage of slope, working with that. We've already talked about trees a good bit, but trees are the great stabilizer on Earth. Not just for slope and soil, but really for climate. The more trees we cut down, you know, the wonkier our climate gets. Trees really just kind of like stabilize everything, large, Areas of trees will stabilize climates. They stabilize carbon cycles. You know, it's a long-term cycle with trees. And that's really what we're looking at. You know, how can we build carbon on our land? We're working with nature. If we take a cutting, it's basically free. We propagate it, we plant it, and then we're letting nature, we're letting the tree, or the tree is breathing, the tree is bringing in carbon, and it's growing its body, and it's all happening, and we're just part of that process of just kind of like a couple steps in it, and then we're working with nature and we're letting the tree do its thing. So it's like a way, it's, again, it's a way of building value on our land, taking advantage of free energy. Water, sunshine, carbon, oxygen, yes. As far as trees and slope goes, I've heard it argued both ways. We've got like a due north facing and due south facing slope. That you should think about planting trees on the north side because uh, they're going to be less susceptible to a late frost in like exactly. the second week of April or so. Yeah. Yeah, I was just curious 
you know, we thought, because I've also heard it said, well, man, find them on the south, they're going to warm up, you get food quicker, you know, I don't yeah, know if it's I think more that's for, You're talking primarily for fruit production. Yes. Yeah. You know, and trees we can use all different ways, you know, whether it's for food, for fuel, fruit, da, 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 da. If it's just fruit production, you're absolutely right. Like in our climate, that's the biggest thing, that we get a late frost, especially, say you plant your your vineyard on the south side, the south side heats up quicker in spring, in late winter, it buds out earlier, and then we get a late frost, and then you lose that crop. But like you're saying, if you plant on the north or the east side, it's slower to bud out, and usually, strategically, it buds out slow enough that the buds are not swollen enough to be affected by the frost. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yep. Guilds are basically just an assembly or an arrangement of plants that work together. So we could, just as an example, we could have our main tree that we want to plant, and we're just thinking of an apple tree for fruit, right? And we could just plant that by itself, and that tree would just be out there by itself. No support. If we think about a guild, a guild is an assembly of plants. So we may plant pea shrub or a locust or something on each side of it that gets bigger quickly. And then we can, you know, here are the roots. So the roots are interacting together. After a couple years, these plants grow a lot quicker than a fruit tree. So what we can do is we can prune this down here. When we prune that, there's an automatic root pruning that happens. And these two, the pea shrub and the locust, are both nitrogen fixers. So on their roots, there's nitrogen nodules. And when we top prune it, the, it, it self prunes the ends of its roots and this nitrogen can then be absorbed into the soil, into the microbiology, and then this plant can take advantage of that. And this will shoot back and regrow. And the same thing is happening over here. And it shoots back and it regrows. And we could do this three or four years where each year we come back and we prune here and we prune here and all these prunings then we can just lay, we can lay on the ground and we can start building soil here. And then after three or four years, we could decide maybe we just want to cut this down and then use this section for fuel or fodder or something else. And this tree has got a head start at that point. So we could do that, you know, it could have a, uh, this could have comfrey around it, which is like this great dynamic accumulator that pulls minerals up from down below. We could have nasturtiums planted around this that attract beneficial insects. Um, and we could just keep layering it and going with it. You know, fruit tree, we could even, sounds crazy, but works pretty well. We could plant, we could plant a grape around this. And those two can live in harmony. And eventually, these will be gone. They've given this, the soil a boost. And, you know, this tree has got a major boost from that. It's got a major head start. And a food forest 
is nothing but an assembly of guilt that we're basically doing the same thing to. You know, we're going to mix it up. There's infinite number of assemblies and possibilities that we could work with. But that's basically, you know, how we could do that. And this, we're getting free nitrogen, free elements, soil building. It's all free. And we're working, harmonizing. We're going with nature. As opposed to just planting an orchard out by itself and, you know, having to fertilize once a year and not really thinking of this soil strata and building this soil layer up. You know, permaculture is like a, you're just, like I said earlier, it's like you're a supercomputer and you're just laying all these different layers over your thoughts. And you're just, you allow yourself to get creative like that. Shade, I've talked about shade, but you know, around your house, having deciduous trees, super handy. Wind block on the north side, Super handy. So those are basically like nine or 10 of your scale of permanence, like your major things that you're gonna work with on a landscape. And then you can kind of like overlay zones. <laughs>